the introduction and coordinating all this. <clears throat> and from this chart, uh, I come to know about uh, some of the excellent works uh, being done in TRDDC and also come to know that most of you are uh, postgraduates and PhDs. Uh, so it is my pleasure and honor to present this talk uh, and interact with you all. And this will be the rough outline of this talk. And the equation free path schemes. Uh, I would estimate about over 10 to 20 people around the world working on it. Such uh, such young and active area of research it is. And even more peculiar, if we take uh, equation free staggered path schemes, there are only four people working on it, which is which includes me and three of my four, three of my PhD supervisors. So I thought uh, because it's uh, it's it's not going to be widely known. I will cover more of the uh, core concepts of equation free multi scale path schemes in the introduction part a little bit more than the detailed results uh, uh, about the staggered path schemes. And then uh, I will also touch upon uh, the potential uh, of staggered path schemes for the CFD in, in the later part. Uh, many physical phenomena uh, exhibit a very complex uh, multi scale nonlinear dynamics and emergent behavior. Uh, there we have many examples like turbulent flows, combustions, sediment transport, and large scale waves like climate, weather, floods, and tsunamis. And these three uh, are uh, the hallmarks of uh, chaotic systems, uh, which uh, many of us know uh, commonly as uh, butterfly effect. So uh, there has really not been a significant advancement of, uh, for uh, simulating such chaotic systems for long times. If you take the weather predictions, which is itself the birthplace of the chaotic systems, uh, even after using uh, many observations from the ground stations, satellite, and many other sources, you, and combining them along with the simulations uh, using what is known as uh, data simulation, we could do only model modestly a uh, good uh, in terms of accuracy, and we can predict only about uh, one week uh, in advance. And even that comes uh, after using supercomputers and many ensemble uh, simulations uh, simultaneously run uh, to account for the uncertainties and the in inaccuracies. So uh, if that's what we can do, uh, even with all these many sources that we get from the data simulation to continuously correct. If we have to uh, do uh, accurate simulation of such multi scale chaotic systems, we thought the data simulation that will be very challenging. And that is indeed the situation for simulating and predicting the, the uh, tsunamis uh, and such large scale waves. For tsunamis, we do not have uh, much of uh, uh, observations uh, like we have for the weather. In tsunamis uh, and many other geophysical fluid dynamics, the typical interest would be only on the macro scale of the order of uh, several kilometers. It could be hundreds and thousands of kilometers. Still, uh, the macro scale dynamics emerges from the strong interactions between the scales. So, for example, very few millimeter uh, uh, physical processes here can influence easily the macro scale dynamics of the order of several uh, hundreds of uh, kilometers. So, we need to uh, account for uh, these micro scale dynamics to accurately capture just the macro scale dynamics. So uh, if we have to uh, capture such my effects of uh, microscale dynamics by doing a very detailed full domain simulation, that would be a, a prohibitively computationally expensive because over a large range of scale, if you were to do a millimeter scale uh, simulation, that would lead to very many state variables or the degrees of freedom. So there are many multi-scale modeling methods uh, uh, namely heterogeneous multi-scale methods and multi-scale finite element methods and empirical orthogonal functions or proper orthogonal decompositions like that. There are many multi-scale methods that uh, aims to reduce this number of state variables so that uh, it can it can do viably uh, large scale problems. 
One such method is the equation-free multi-scale uh, path schemes, which is more recent, very flexible and powerful, which is going to be the uh, central uh, part of the talk. Let's see an, a simple example of uh, full domain simulation. By full domain simulation, what I mean is detailed simulation over the whole domain. And uh, can, let's say we want to simulate the uh, simple time evolution of a diffusion of concentration C in, in a 2D space with periodic boundary conditions. And throughout this talk, we are going to consider only the per periodic boundary conditions. And in this case, what we will typically do is take the continuous space, discretize into a finite uh, uh, grid. And here it is the collocated uh, grid with the grid spacing uh, small delta in both the directions. And then we will use our, uh, in one approach, we will use the finite uh, difference approximation of the spatial derivatives that will give this uh, ODEs or the scheme. Because we did not discretize the time, uh, what we get is the ODE, and this process is uh, method of lines. Uh, uh, we do not discretize the time here uh, because it gives a lot of flexibility in analytically uh, analyzing the solutions. And additionally, we can also use many standard ODE integrators uh, and quickly test. So throughout this talk, we will be talking and using only the method of lines. And this is the full domain simulation. We will just evaluate these time derivatives and integrate that numerically for a time step delta t, which could be variable time step. And we will say this full domain simulation uh, to be consistent when this uh, discrete equation approximates the continuous equation better and better when we make the time step and the spatial grid size smaller and smaller. That's when we will say this full domain simulation is consistent. And now if you look at uh, uh, the multi-scale path schemes, instead of computing on all these uh, nodes, the path schemes compute only on a very few subset of these nodes. And these uh, the nodes where the path scheme computes are very sparsely located, typically uh, separated by kilometers. And the computation within the patches uh, happens in a very uh, small fraction of the space. Uh, that's how the path schemes achieve its uh, computational advantage. <coughs> and yeah, uh, these uh, unsimulated nodes are later interpolated for post-processing. These uh, uh, multi-scale path schemes are the usual multi-scale path schemes were initially developed for stochastic systems by Kevrakides uh, and others uh, in their research group in John Hopkins uh, Research University in the US and then later extended and uh, substantially analyzed for uh, deterministic uh, grid-based methods like FDEM. Uh, I think it's only finite difference method right now. Uh, some people have uh, attempted finite ailment within the patches. Uh, by two research groups, uh, primarily one is uh, AJ Roberts from University of Adelaide. That's my uh, PhD supervisor, principal supervisor, and IJ, uh, IJ Kevrak is from John Hopkins University itself. And how does this uh, uh, patches uh, are coupled? So uh, if you start out as patch scheme simulation, initially we will know all the patch interior nodes because that comes from the initial conditions. And then we will create uh, what are known as edge nodes around each of these patches. These un unfilled circles are called edge nodes. So we have interior nodes and then we have edge nodes. We have got the equations. Uh, we could use uh, the simple diffusion equation or wave equation or anything. So that's called micro scale or sub pass micro scale model. So we'll start out with the initial values. We'll compute what is known as aggregate value or the macro scale value or the patch value. There are many names for this. And that will basically be a representative value of each of these patches. So now we will have one value for each of the patches. That's what we call macro scale value. Because we have one value for each of the patches, we can do a macro scale interpolation. This macro scale interpolation over e is over a large scale, capital D of the order of uh, kilometers. Whereas the computations within the patches happen uh, in the order of millimeters. And then using these macro scale values, we interpolate to find the edge values. Now that we have got the interior value and the edge value, we can evaluate the uh, evolution equations and integrate that and the cycle continues. This way, the patch coupling actually provides two-way coupling uh, or two-way connection. 
uh, in the sense that from from the macro scale values from each patches, it carries information to the micro scale. These are micro scale nodes separated by very, very small distances. And then by computing the aggregate values from the patch interior values, it passes the information from the micro scale to the macro scale, and that's how the patch coupling works. If we apply the diffusion, uh, simple diffusion equations for for the uh, patch scheme, uh, the usual or collocated patch scheme. This is how it will be. We will simply attach additional indices capital I and capital J for each of the patches. The usual full domain uh, simulation or full domain model looks like this. We discretize over the whole space using collocated grid with the grid spacing small delta and small delta. And the corresponding macro scale patch grid. This is a patch grid. And on the macro scale, we have uh, the macro grid spacing capital delta. There is a one to one correspondence between this full domain uh, grid and this patch grid. We have uh, the same domain length L and L. And here we have I and J capital I and J indices for the patches and small I and J for the full domain simulation. And we have we use small N to designate the number of intervals. Here it is capital N. And inside these patches, as I showed before, but there are micro sub patch micro grids uh, you know, surrounded by the edge nodes. So now that we have got the edge nodes and the patch interior nodes, we just have to evaluate this equation, which is the given model to us. For each of the patches and couple them and integrate them. Now we will call uh, such a patch scheme to be consistent when the patch scheme becomes better and better approximation of the full domain uh, model without these capital I and J indices. So our target here is the full domain model, not the PDE anymore, because we are we are aiming so, to approximate. Uh, there is a question. Our, sorry. There is a question. Yep. Is the location of yeah, patch ahead. is the location of patch random or user selected? How are boundary and initial right. conditions for the patch given? Yeah, the, the it, it is a discretization process, just like how we discretize uh, the CFD mesh. Yeah, we need to mesh using the patches. First, we need to position the patches, and inside the uh, patches, we need to create the grid. So, so right it now, is, it is user uh, created. I mean, true. We, we first uh, create them, and then this numerical thing comes into picture. Yes, yes. The, so, creating such a multi scale patch grid is. Uh, is a user's uh, work, yeah. So it oh, has I think to... the the question was, uh, does every grid point has a patch, or uh, you have patches only when you think the micro scale dynamics are important? And how uh, do we know that? The second case, uh, wherever we feel that there is significant uh, variation of the micro scale dynamics, we should put a patch there. That that's how oh. it is. Okay. But uh, right now, uh, all the focus, uh, all the development has been only with a fixed set position and equally spaced uh, patches. So okay. this is, so the patch scheme is still very, very young. We have not even, uh, I mean, the realistic boundary conditions, even they are not tested. All, almost all the patch scheme research is now on only with the periodic boundary conditions. And almost all the patch grids are developed with equally spaced grids. So it's it's okay. a very, in a very, very young stage. But uh, as you rightly asked, when we want to capture more of a, uh, more of a highly varying micro scale physics, we would need more patches around that region. Yeah, something like the adaptive grid or the grid refinement, uh, sorry, the grading, mesh grading, something like that. Yeah. We can okay. roughly. Thank you. Yep. We can roughly think of each of these patch uh, as a, as a node point. So wherever we want to put a patch, we can put a patch. That's the futuristic thing. But right now it's all equally spaced. Divar, there is a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Gautam, so, this question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, Divar, Gautam. Uh, so the way I'm sort of looking at it is that essentially what you are doing is a, a representative volume uh, around a grid point at a macro scale and doing uh, a localized, more uh, detailed analysis or whatever it is, and you are essentially homogenizing it to pass back to the higher length scale. Is that a fair way of putting it? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I think that's a, uh, that's a very rough approximation. The, the representative volume element, uh, I do not uh, have much detail, uh, detailed understanding about it. Yeah, the, in that sense, yes, this is comparable to the representative volume element. But by the, the main uh, strength and the difference from the other multiscale modeling here is the equation free part. So uh, there is no uh, explicit equations to connect the scales. So it's a simple generic interpolation of the edge nodes. Yeah. That's, so that's, so that's, could essentially, that's, why, that's why you are essentially homogenizing it to get an effective property or an effective behavior at the nodal level, at the, at the higher length scale. Is that true? True. It's a, it's a numerical uh, homogenization and it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's like an on-demand homogenization. So wherever right. it's required, the system right. will evolve the uh, homogenization. Yeah. Okay. 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 And, and, and the second question uh, uh, related to this is that this, in this process, is it becoming essentially a one-way coupling? Between no, the scales? no, not at all. Yeah. It's a two-way yeah. coupling, but there is okay. information flowing from both macro scale to micro scale and micro scale to macro scale, and it's all it's all uh, inbuilt to the equations without any human interaction. So no, user doesn't no, have no, to. The, the, the why I'm asking this question is because you are using some kind of a periodic boundary conditions. Yeah, right, right now. So yeah. that 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 means you are putting a huge amount of effective restriction on flow of information from the higher length scale to the lower length scale? Uh, I, I wouldn't see that exactly. So if you look at that, if, if the periodicity comes after like a thousand kilometers for uh, for the hundred, for, for about the hundred kilometers at the center part, we don't have to, the, the periodicity is not restricting much, right? If we think about the millimeter scale and the hundred kilometer scale at the center part of the periodic domain. Okay, so so if your if your essential uh, effective gradients across this representative uh, patch or volume that you are talking about is extremely small, mm -hmm. then that is okay. But uh, it all depends on where in the domain uh, you are in, right? Uh, when when essentially there is True. a transition near the surface, yeah, yeah, things are not the same. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I I, also, I agree with you. So uh, basically, yeah, one, in all yeah. the simulation that we do, we just uh, Try to put the something, some variable, variable uh, thing in the in the middle and test how it evolves. And as soon as any disturbance uh, or perturbations move near the boundary, uh, of course that's uh, that's only periodically repeating it. Uh, yeah, that's how we test it only in the middle part. But that's only to develop the equations. But the that cannot cause any restrictions on the on the model or the method itself. It is no, only no, for the I development. No, that that is right. See, there's there's a difference between what a model can do with what it has versus how 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 much of reality and what are the approximations it is making for the reality. That's where I'm asking coming from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a fair one. Of course, I I do understand this is non-trivial uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. So typically, when when uh, people develop any numerical methods, they will just keep uh, try to keep the uncertainties to the minimal. So the boundary conditions we will worry later. Uh, so first we will develop the method and the boundary conditions we will further develop later. That's how uh, generally uh, I think many schemes are developed. Uh, I think people follow the same approach even for developing the path schemes. Sure. sure. There was one uh, accompanied question. Uh, yeah. Because this is a time-varying scheme, like you have a temporal True. variation. So there is uh, some sort of, uh, there is a parabolic nature to this uh, scheme, right? Uh, sorry, to the equations. But if you take an elliptic uh, equations, like we have a Poisson's equation, which is, uh, uh, which actually is a very tight coupling uh, among all the nodes in the domain. Let's say you do something uh, at the boundary, like maybe a million kilometers uh, away, uh, that still affects the variable at the center of the grid. So have you applied this scheme for Poisson solvers? Uh, no, but uh, people have uh, attempted for, uh, for uh, adding like a pseudo uh, time dependence. Uh, uh, okay. People have uh, solved that. So basically we need to cost the uh, Poisson equation as a time dependent uh, uh, equation and then solve that. So uh, that's how uh, we can use this. But uh, okay. yeah, one one point that you said, yeah, everywhere it's almost like ellipticity. The couple because of the patch coupling, it's almost like elliptic equation because a disturbance in any place is going to be affected everywhere instantly. 
that's right. an important yeah. point okay yeah and uh, in the speed up studies you are going to show will those be for the poisson's or equation speed up studies or for this parabolic equation uh, so the main focus will be totally on the waves so on the wave uh, pro 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 propagation okay yeah wave propagation yeah okay thank you okay all right i'll uh, continue now uh, please feel free to uh, jump in and ask the questions anytime OK, so uh, that's how we define the consistency here. When Whenever uh, we decrease the step size, both in space and time, the path scheme should uh, tend to become better and better macro scale approximation of the full domain uh, model. And now uh, this is our some general uh, summary of the advantages of equation free multi scale method. This is equation free. There is no explicit uh, equation to couple uh, just like in uh, in one one equation model and two equation models in turbulence modeling. We don't have anything like that. This is loosely comparable to algebraic turbulence models where there is no explicit equations, but there's a significant difference between the equation free and the algebraic models in that this uh, truly captures the dynamic history, uh, unlike the algebraic turbulence models. And patch schemes are highly accurate. If you compare this with the RANS and the LES, the RANS and LES typically use empirical uh, subgrid modeling, but the patch schemes uh, capture the real physics at the micro scale. There is no empirical modeling. And uh, that we can achieve arbitrarily higher order core scale consistency by decreasing the inter patch spacing, the capital delta I was talking about. And uh, we can achieve arbitrary consistency by using up accordingly higher order interpolations for the patch coupling. And the patch schemes are highly efficient because it computes only on a very few degrees of freedom. Patch schemes uh, are very flexible in the sense we can use pretty much any model within the patches. You can use mesh based models like finite difference, finite element, finite volume, even though finite difference has been uh, used widely so far in the current research. And you can also use meshless models like uh, smooth through particle hydrodynamics, lattice Boltzmann, Monte Carlo, or mo molecular dynamics, pretty much anything. And uh, patch schemes are easy to implement because you don't really uh, tinker around uh, the model uh, much. So you just take the well developed, well tested model and put that inside the patches and wrap it around using uh, interpolation to couple the edge nodes. We have so many advantages for the patch schemes. Uh, so it has been very successful for the dissipative systems but it could not uh, handle the waves uh, well. We'll see why. And uh, Kao and Roberts uh, extended uh, in 2013 uh, the equation-free path schemes to 1D waves, and my PhD work developed the equation-free multi-dimensional multi-scale uh, staggered path schemes that uh, accurately and efficiently simulate complex nonlinear waves over a large space. And this uh, staggered path schemes open up many opportunities for multi scale simulation of complex nonlinear waves and flows. And this is the usual uh, uh, collocator grid uh, in 1D and 2D. Here, the variables, all the variables are computed on the same places. And here is the usual Harlow. Uh, uh, staggered grid in 1D and 2D. Here one cell will be like this, all the variables. The H, U and V here will be for the height of the wave and the U and V are the horizontal velocities of the wave that I'm going to discuss shortly. This will be the one cell comprising the H, U, V, three variables, and this will be the corresponding cell in the staggered grid. And uh, most of us will be, I think, aware of these uh, staggering. And uh, if we now come to the uh, simple uh, ideal wave. This is a simple ideal wave. If we combine these two together by the double differentiating, we'll get the usual more single uh, second order wave equation. And this is cost in terms of height H and U, so uh, roughly uh, representing the shallow water wave, but very idealistic. And if we uh, assume an answered solution of this form, exponential i k x plus lambda t, and substitute this into it, we'll get the eigenvalue of this PD, which will be plus or minus IK. I is the imaginary unit here. And the imaginary part of this lambda, which is uh, pure imaginary here, the K is going to be the wave frequency. And because we know uh, the relationship between omega and K, this characterizes the dispersion relation. There are two things important when we compute uh, uh, for the wave-like systems. 
one is the accuracy general accuracy but apart from the accuracy we would like to represent or accurately represent these dispersion relation also by our discrete models so let's see how uh, the other models uh, discrete models compare with this first uh, i am uh, discretizing this using a collocated grid forward difference scheme just a simple 1d discretization and two delta is the spacing here so that we will have the same number of uh, nodes both in staggered grid and the collocated grid if we just discretize that using a simple forward finite difference which is uh, first order accurate and then substitute the corresponding discrete answers for the arbitrary Fourier mode, we will be able to derive the eigenvalue for this full domain simulation in 1D. And this eigenvalue uh, contains a real path value, which means it's not going to be accurate. It could, uh, depending upon the values of K and delta, it could either be unstable or it could be excessively diffusive compared to the original uh, pure uh, imaginary eigenvalues. And this gives the uh, frequency of the wave. And because we have computed the frequency of the wave in terms of the wave number K, that is basically the dispersion relation. If we plot the dispersion relation, this is how we get uh, it only for a very small region in the wave number space, it, uh, it represents the dispersion relation accurately. That's the case for the first order collocated finite difference on the uh, collocated grid. If we use the second order central difference here for these derivatives and then uh, substitute the same answers and we get uh, the eigenvalue, but here the real part disappears and we get the pure imaginary part, which is good. This, this means that, I mean, not very surprisingly, the second order accurate central difference give, uh, scheme gives uh, better accurate, uh, better accuracy. But if you look at the uh, dispersion relation, the free dispersion relation is exactly same as the first order uh, dispersion relation here. So if you plot uh, the dispersion relation, that's going to be exactly same uh, on top of this. But if you now uh, do the same uh, discretization using finite difference central second order approximation on a staggered grid, and then if you substitute the corresponding uh, Fourier mode and derive the eigenvalue, we get the pure eigenvalue. OK, we have caught up for the accuracy. But then the dispersion relation is slightly different. And this dispersion relation on a staggered grid follows the uh, dispersion relation of the PDE much closer. And if you look at the collocated grid dispersion rela relation, even for the second order uh, scheme, about two third of the frequency space is not representing uh, the true wave physics. Particularly, if you look at the high frequency area here, the, the frequency becomes literally zero here, which means the highest frequency resolved on a grid will not propagate at all. Now, if we put a collocated grid inside a patch, especially the patches are very small and it's going to resolve a very high frequency, very high wave number modes. And the highest wave number modes will not propagate at all, and it will be stuck within the patches. That's the reason uh, the collocated patch grid is not that great for the waves, and that's why uh, patch schemes have uh, never been successful for the waves so far. So staggered grids are the best for the waves in general, and also for the multi-scale modeling. Now, uh, this will be our prototypical model for throughout this talk, and this is a simple nonlinear water wave. Uh, the nonlinearity comes here because of this multiplicating factor H and U and H and V here. And CD is the drag coefficient because of the bed friction. And CV is the viscous diffusion. You can compare that with the viscosity. <coughs> H is the height and U and V are the horizontal velocities. That's going to be our prototypical model. We would aim to uh, accurately simulate. This, uh, this does not have any multi-scale structure, but this will we will use this to uh, develop and analyze uh, uh, the patch schemes for this. And now we want to characterize uh, how the, the PD itself is going to evolve uh, using the eigenvalues, just like we did for the simple ideal case. But in this case, if you look at uh, these uh, wave PDE, there is a drift term. This is a drift term. If, if you substitute into this PDE just a constant solution uh, and then take a time, time de spatial derivative, all the other terms will go off, but this will stay which means if we just let a uniform flow with a constant height, it will keep on decelerating because of the bit friction. That's a constant drift. We don't want to capture this constant drift as a, 
as an in unstable behavior. So what we do here is instead of substituting very simple uh, perturbation here, we substitute this form where A1 and A2 are accelerations. This will be now a function of the CD. In fact, I think it will be either CD or uh, uh, minus CD. So uh, this sub by substituting this kind of Fourier mode into the PDE, we can derive an Eigen system and the eigenvalue of that and the Jacobian of this Eigen system will characterize the perturbation on top of this mean accelerating flow. So that's what we want to characterize. We know that the accelerate, there is an accelerating component and we don't want to capture that as an instability. All right, so we will follow the similar uh, answers and substituting uh, into the PDE and the discrete equations. We will derive the eigenvalues and we will compare the eigenvalues to assess the accuracy, consistency, and so on. If we discretize the same uh, simple nonlinear uh, water wave here on a staggered grid, this is what we get using a simple uh, second order uh, consistent scheme here. And now if we substitute a analog discrete for arbitrary Fourier mode using the same uh, answers, but now here it is discrete instead of a Kx, it is Ki delta. And I del the delta is the uh, grid spacing here. And then if we substitute this into this finite difference equation and then uh, cancel the terms on both sides, the exponential terms, and then neglecting the nonlinear terms that are nonlinear in H and U, uh, we will get an Eigen system and the Eigen values and this Jacobian will characterize the perturbations, these perturbations on top of the stationary accelerating mean flow. And now uh, we were, if we were to simulate the diffusion, for the diffusion, this is what we did. We just uh, took the microscale model, attached the, the capital I and capital J index so that we can compute on all the patches. And then we said that it will be consistent if this becomes a better and better approximation as capital delta is decreased. And we use the collocated grid inside. We are just going to do the same thing for the waves here. We attach the capital I and capital J, which means we are going to compute all the given model on each of these patches. And here we have a concept of cell here. We have one cell here. This is a full domain model cell. And here we have got a macro cell here. So consisting of three patches, that will become a macro cell here. And then capital I in capital J, small i in small j, there is a correspondence, all that going on. Now we need to put the patch inside. OK, so this is the staggering at the macro scale. So the path, staggered path scheme that we develop has two, two levels of staggering. Staggering at the macro scale as well as the staggering at the micro scale within the patches. So the consistency stays the same. And then using this model uh, added with the coupling on the edge nodes, we will just integrate the ODE and that becomes our system that will give the solution. That's the staggered path scheme. But uh, we we have we are not totally done here. We have staggered on the macro scale, but not on the micro scale. So uh, we started with this collocated grid in 2D, which is invented by Harlow and Welk, and we went from here to here, the full domain staggered grid. If we were to extend this uh, collocated grid to a multi-scale staggered uh, scheme, this is how a multi-scale patch grid will look for a collocated grid. We just take the collocated grid and put it in all the patches, add the edge nodes around all the patches. All the patches here are identical and we are good. That's going to be straightforward. But if we have to use the staggered pitch, uh, the staggered sub patch microgrid inside, that's where the difficulty arises. Because of the heterogeneous nodes of the, uh, H, U and V here, uh, in, in CFD it will be pressure and velocities. There are totally 1,67,040 uh, possible subpatch grids here. These are all compatible subpatch grids. There are we can do only this many possible subpatch grids, not anything more, because all these patches are compatible. If we were to compute the second derivative or even the first derivative at the location of this U node, we need uh, the H nodes on both sides. So we need to have this node. We don't need an H node here. 
So in that sense, all these grids are compatible. We can compute the wave equation on all of these grids. So if the number of subgrid in uh, subpatch grid intervals divided by two, n by two is even, we have these 16 types of subpatch microgrids. If it is odd, we have slightly different, but again 16 uh, type of microgrids. If you look at here, for these, the these subpatch grids are identified by the edge nodes. So here we have H, here we have H, here V. So it will be H, H, and VV. The H, H, and VV here has a center node, and here the H, H, VV has the center node, but that's not going to be same for all here. Here U, U, and VV has center node, but here it does not. So overall, we have uh, this many sub possible subpatch microgrids, and we need to put the some of these uh, subpatch microgrids inside the patches. Now, which one should we put? So if we split the macro scale patch grid where these are all patches, like a two by two cell, each of these patch could come for a given n from one of these 16 possible grids. And there, one of the patch can be empty. So there are 16 plus one, and there are four patches inside. So 16 plus one power four, minus one to avoid the all empty patch. We don't want to have all empty. That's not even a grid. We will have uh, this many uh, possible staggered patch grids. And because of the difference between the odd and even n by two, we have to multiply that by two. We get 1,67,000 possible uh, staggered grids. Now, which one should we use? That's the uh, That was the challenging thing. We identified and constructed all the uh, 167,040 possible grids, and we made the code work for all the possible uh, grids. And then uh, we analyzed all the grids. So now uh, this is one one possible uh, uh, index notation here. Okay, so if we were to substitute the ANSAT solution for this, it becomes a little bit messy here. So we have the same mean flow, same acceleration. And then the factors the here will consist of capital delta here. We want to capture the macro scale evolution, and we want to keep all the micro scale pair structure within each cell, each macro scale. So any micro scale variation within each macro cell will be captured by these terms, and we are not particularly interested about that in, in this Fourier mode. So we substitute that into that. Uh, and then we get an eigen system again here. We need to adopt uh, three types of indices uh, to capture this multi scale Fourier mode. The small i and small j, as usual, subpatch microgrid index, and capital I and capital J are macro scale in the index. And additionally, we need this small p and small q, which are called a subpatch micro sub cell patch index. They are just uh, i mod 2 and j mod 2. So substituting this into the path scheme uh, here with basically the original given model with the I and J uh, index attached to the superscript. And as usual, neglect the nonlinear terms and cancel out the exponential factors and things like that. We will get an eigen system like uh, J times X equal to lambda P times X. The lambda P, the P stands for path scheme. And for the pre previous full domain case, we got three by three systems. It will basically be H, U, and V, three by three cell. But here, uh, it will be NPI by NPI, and there's uh, an expression that tells how big this state vector will be. This uh, That depends on the number of uh, subpatch grid intervals here. And the smallest that we found to be useful was 59. So it will be 59 by 59. And this will, uh, this eigenvalue, patch scheme eigenvalue, and the Jacobian will characterize the time evolution of the perturbation about the mean accelerating flow. So we can, we'll be able to assess the patch schemes if there is any additional artificial instability or, or the accuracy wise, is it good enough, and things like that by comparing the eigenvalues instead of comparing the time simulation. So because we are comparing the times, uh, instead of comparing the time simulation, we, if we compare the eigenvalues, in some sense, it's global that it covers many possible combinations of the modes. OK, I'll uh, quickly show this uh, uh, demonstration of uh, how, how these eigenvalue spectrum look. Okay. 
This is the eigenvalue spectrum for uh, simple nonlinear water wave of the PDE itself and the full domain simulation. So this is how the real part and the imaginary part of the complex uh, uh, plane uh, eigenvalues look. <clears throat> And the one main thing, this is an interactive app. One main thing that I wanted to show here is if the wave numbers are small, these, these magenta uh, circles and plus represent uh, the eigenvalue for a particular wave number. So when I have the wave number small, the wave numbers are displayed here. They are near zero. And as I increase the wave number, the imaginary parts increases. And that's the only thing that I wanted to uh, mainly show from here. And this is for uh, the U mean velocity zero and zero. Uh, if we make that mean velocity non-zero, a lot of interesting stuff happens because when it is zero, it's as good as linear wave, but when it is non-zero, it becomes uh, very rich and interesting. There's a lot of things happening here, like the highest wave numbers will move along a boundary and many interesting things. That's not so much important for our uh, focus. That the main information is low wave number waves eigenvalues are captured here and we want to capture the macro scale waves accurately which means we need to capture the uh, eigenvalues accurately around this region that's the main point <clears throat> and uh, i have shown here uh, two uh, eigenvalue spectrum of the path schemes for uh, ideal wave here and uh, simple linear wave here so uh, we will not deal with uh, such a nonlinear wave for for, for some time here and ideally what we want is uh, the in this region we want to make sure that eigenvalues of the full domain which is uh, notated here with these small circles so if we plot the eigenvalues uh, for a full domain simulation it goes like this and spanning all across here but if we do a uh, patch scheme computation it just results accurately these macro scale wave numbers of small uh, wave number and when the wave number increases, this is going to be uh, corresponding to the ripples that I have shown in the tsunami. Uh, we don't, we are not interested in it. The, we want to accurately capture this, and this is uh, this patch scheme is uh, particularly known as spectral patch scheme, and it it almost exactly within numerical round of errors, it exactly captures the macro scale modes of these simulations, the full domain waves. That's the big success of this. And the corresponding ideal waves, it captures exactly. There are two points here. One, it agrees exactly with the eigenvalues. Number two, there is no real part positive eigenvalues. All the eigenvalues are here. It doesn't go to the right side of the uh, complex plane. And this is what we want from the path schemes. And this is, uh, the, I'm showing this a priori uh, for one of the good path schemes. Okay, coming back to the patch grids, there were 167 patch grids, right? Uh, for those patch grids, if we plot, this is how the spectrum becomes. For an ideal wave, instead of being like this on the on the left side, it becomes like this. We have positive real part eigenvalues, and there are many, many modes, highly unstable. That's just one example patch grid for which it, it is not possible to have a stable patch scheme on this patch grid. And there is another example, not much difference. That's just another example. And almost all such pass grids are unstable. If we plot the maximum real part of the eigenvalues of a very good spectral patch scheme on all these patch grids, almost all of them are unstable. We can see that here the 10 to the power of minus 5 is what uh, we have designated uh, to be the boundary between the stability and inst uh, instability. So anything, anywhere maximum real part of the eigenvalue is less than 10 to the minus 5, we take that as stable. And anything more than that is unstable. And there's only 1,248 among the 167,000 grids are stable. And both these pluses and these uh, blue circles, they are all stable. And now, <coughs> if we look at the imaginary parts of the eigenvalues, it also needs to agree with the imaginary parts of the eigenvalues of the full domain simulation. The full domain model eigenvalues are plotted here with the black lines here. So now I have plotted only for the 1024 uh, cases. Right, we have had a 1024 
248 patch grades. For those, some of these, uh, depending upon the value of n by 2, this is n by 2 being even and this is n by 2 being odd. So that comes to 624 plus 624. And only the blue circles here agree with the black uh, lines, which means almost all of these uh, patch games that are stable are not accurate. So totally 120 patch grids among the 1 lakh patch grids, which is about 0.072 percentage, gives stable and accurate uh, patch games. And this is one good uh, multi-scale staggered grid that we have picked. And all these blue circles are equally good compared to this. There is nothing special about this. We just picked this because it looks uh, uh, kind of self-similar with the full domain stagger grid. We have H, H centered patch here, U centered patch here, and V centered patch here. So this looks kind of uh, like a H, U, H, U, and V inside this kind of self-similarity, but that doesn't give any advantage. This is only as good as any other 60. Uh, 120 staggered grid. OK, now we come to check the spectrum, eigenvalue spectrum of a patch scheme on, on a good patch grid. How, how well uh, on this patch grid, a patch scheme, how well it performs. That's what we are going to check here. And we see that the spectral patch scheme is exact in the sense it computes exactly the macro scale modes for different values of the different physical parameters. We want to make sure that the patch scheme exactly captures. It doesn't so happen that for some parameters it captures exactly and for some parameters it doesn't work. No, it's not the case. We confirm that it exactly captures the macro scale modes here. We can see that the slow, small uh, wave number macro scale modes are exactly captured. The eigenvalues exactly agree with, uh, with the full domain models. And now that's that's what is known as spectral patch question, scheme. Divar. Yep. So the question is like for a given simulation, yep. does all patches have same patch grid or they can vary? Uh, you got, you got I, it, right? You change yes, I got it. for single simulation, yeah. you change everything. So you take one at one place, other means within one simulation, multiple schemes can you have? Currently, no. This? Currently, no. I mean, it, it will the, be interesting to know. Sorry? It will be interesting to know why, because you say like there are possible, uh, there are so many possible uh, schemes which give you a correct solution, but if they are all together, what will happen? Uh, it, it's a good question. Uh, it's, it's only my guess that uh, we will not be able to use that. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say strongly that it is not possible. If we restrict ourselves to this blue circle, basically the 120, good patch grades among those if we mix and match uh, that's a good question it can, i don't know uh, it's actually a, a kind of a research question uh, i am skeptical about that because from my experience here anything you do with the patch grid it's going to screw up the the spectrum it's going to become uh, unstable any coding error any small uh, change in the position of the nodes it all results almost immediately to the uh, unstable things. So I'm a bit skeptical. That is also very restrictive. Uh, I got your point where you're heading. Uh, yeah, right now you can you should take this patch grid and use everywhere in the domain the same kind of patch grid. That's the status now. And I'm hoping that it could improve. Uh, and if it does not improve, it may not be useful too much for complex grids. And I'm positive it will improve, but currently no. Currently, no answer. Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. Yeah. OK, I'll continue. Yes, you okay. please continue. Yeah. So that's the exact accuracy of the spectral patch scheme. I said the spectral patch scheme. When I say spectral patch scheme, basically it means that the patch coupling interpolation is done using spectral interpolation. So basically, you take the mac patch macro scale values from each of the patch, take Fourier transform, do a shift uh, as much as uh, the edge nodes are offset from the patch centers, and then do inverse Fourier transform. That's how we do the spectral interpolation. 
And if you interpolate the patch edge nodes using spectral interpolation, that becomes the spectral patch scheme. But if, if you use a polynomial interpolation, something like a 2D Lagrangian uh, polynomial interpolation, that becomes a polynomial interpolation based patch scheme, in short, polynomial patch scheme or polynomial staggered patch scheme. So on the left, I have shown the staggered patch scheme. On the right, I'm showing the polynomial patch scheme because the, the spectral patch scheme it will not go be our front in the long run because spectral patch scheme requires a periodic boundary condition, typically or almost always, and uh, and very very symmetric and simple uh, geometries. So if you were to go for realistic uh, letter CFD, and we would need a polynomial interpolation, and we tested for four uh, different degree polynomial interpolations. Uh, they are shown here by P2, P4. P6 and P8. And the lowest uh, interpolation, second degree polynomial uh, interpolation coupling gives a reasonable uh, accuracy. The macro scale modes are somewhat close, but not as accurate as the spectral thing. But when we increase the interpolation order, when we go from P2 to P4, the accuracy certainly improves. And then when we for example, here we can see better agreement. When we improve the order of uh, interpolation, now we get to see the second, third, and modes are coming closer, and eventually it becomes more close. So what this shows is that as we increase the order of polynomial interpolation in the patch coupling, we get better accuracy. That's uh, that's a very important thing. And now we look at uh, the consistency of the staggered patch scheme. We said that as we decrease the macro scale grid spacing capital delta, we want uh, the patch scheme to be better and better approximate a mission of the full domain micro scale model. And here we compare uh, the epsilon one zero. What that means is this is the difference between the eigenvalues of the first mode, typically this mode. And this will be first mode, and this will be second eigenvalue, and like that. Why does why do I call this first and second? This is the lowest wave number mode, and the next highest higher wave number mode will be this, and that's how it will go. I think I had a picture like that. Uh, some yeah, here uh, I didn't probably did not say it. As we increase the wave number, this is how the eigenvalues go here. So our main focus is here, and then it will be better if we resolve this accurately and like that. The priority decreases here. So we want to see uh, how the patch schemes perform as we decrease the macro scale uh, grid spacing capital delta here, and uh, it does converge very nicely. And this is the worst case convergence. By worst case, what I mean is we have done the convergence study for various patch scale ratio. I did not introduce this yet. The patch scale ratio is the ratio of the patch size to their interpatch distance. Basically, small l divided by two times the capital delta. That quantifies how small we simulate on the domain compared to how large the patches are separated. So this patch scale ratio, uh, we have tested for a very huge range uh, of patch scale ratio. This is 0 0.0001. That is really tiny. And the different number of microgrid intervals, small n, different number of uh, capital n, different number of macro grid interval capital n for this many values and the physical parameters cd and cv about nine values and for all these uh, patch schemes among all these convergence studies uh, yeah 2160 combinations this is the worst convergence this is worst because of these deviations what do i mean by deviations here the solid lines here represents the polynomial fit here and the polynomial fit, if you see, is power p. That, that basically tells that the convergence, it as we decrease the capital delta, the eigenvalues of the patch scheme agree better and better with the eigenvalues of the full domain model at the at the rate of the same degree as the polynomial uh, interpolation. That's an excellent. That's the best we can hope for. That's an excellent result here. So if we want a, a very good uh, resolution, basically we need to have smaller macro scale delta 
and higher order interpolation. This is the best we hoped for, and that's how it is. And this deviation uh, is this deviation. If you see the small circles here, those circles correspond to the smallest to patch scale ratio, which means the patches are very very small. And when the patches are very very small here, the interpatch uh, the sub patch microgrid interval small delta becomes about 10 to the minus five or so. And through the computation in the finite difference quotients, all that it it touches the regime of a round of errors. So this is essentially because of the round of errors. That's the case for the polynomial patch schemes. If we compare how uh, the spectral patch scheme uh, uh, eigenvalues compare with the full domain eigenvalues, they do not show any trend, just as we expect, because all the spectral patch scheme should be the almost same accurate with uh, without any dependence on the macro scale interval because the spectral interpolation gives uh, almost the exact interpolation within a numerical round of errors. So basically the highest error itself is like 10 to the minus 5 and the lowest goes very small 10 to the minus 11. Basically this says that the spectral patch scheme is consistent irrespective of the mac macro grid interval. That's what we would expect. And this is the typical patch scheme simulation, which was in the title slide, I guess. So we, here I have compared the full domain simulation, which are these gray lines. This is a, this is a simple linear progressive wave, just for a demonstration. And these are the patches. We can see the staggered patches here, like uh, these will be H patch and U patch and V patch like that. And these simulations agree almost, uh, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say exactly, but it agree very closely with the full domain simulation. But we did not simulate in these gaps. And uh, the patches here are actually not the real sizes of the patches. We will not be able to see the patches if we plotted that with the real size of the patches. So just for the visualization, the patches are enlarged here. And these grid interval are not the real interval. That will be much finer. We will not be able to see the grid. So basically, we have saved a lot in, uh, in saving the uh, number of degrees of freedom. And uh, just to show a video of the time simulation, I this is a old video. I have not uh, managed to get a new video. So this is a simple linear wave uh, with the initial condition of a Gaussian hump. This is how the path scheme simulation evolves. And what we have in the in the bottom is the simple nonlinear wave. It's a same, very similar wave. This is this is having HU and HV in the in the special derivative. This has just U and V in the special derivatives. And there is a little bit of difference we can see between the linear wave and nonlinear wave, which is not the focus here. But what the main point here is the patch scheme computes only in those places where these ribbons cross. OK, only in those places where the ribbons cross, the patch scheme actually does the computation, which means that there's a lot of saving. And if we do a computational complexity study, it shows that the times computational time of the patch scheme divided by the computational time of the full domain simulation will be of the order of 3 R square. Or R square. So. This R is the patch scale ratio. If R is very small, like 0 0.001, and then R square will be much smaller. And, and that's how the compute time ratio uh, come out. So these are the actual measured compute times. What I have done here is, I have done a one iteration of time simulation using a full domain simulation and then compute the time, uh, compute time it takes, that is Tm delta. And then I have done a path scheme, one, one night time simulation, one time step computation using the path scheme, and divide that uh, using, uh, and call that compute time ratio. This compute time ratio goes as low as 10 to the minus five. This is what I have been putting everywhere as 10 to the five times uh, saving and 100,000 times savings, all that. So these squares correspond to our patch scale ratio of 0 0.1, and these crosses are 0 0.01, and these pluses are 0 0.001. And one important point here is we don't lose anything by decreasing the patch scale ratio. So this patch scale ratio, if we decrease it, basically, we 
it will not affect anything on the macro scale modes. It will only uh, resolve the modes using much finer subgrids. But because it computes on fewer nodes, it's going to give a much bigger computational savings. So we could very easily use uh, the path scale ratio of R0.001 until we are hit with the numerical round of errors. So here I have avoided the lowest uh, uh, path scale ratio which we have used in the analysis just because the it will show too much reduction, but uh, we will not be able to use uh, in for some of those combinations because of the round of errors. But this value of path scale ratio of R001 is very much uh, in the application range. And that is the level of uh, uh, computational savings the path schemes uh, can achieve. And that is in the two dimensional case, uh, the computational complexity quantification three R square, that's for the two dimensional case. If you go to the three dimensional case, we can achieve R cube as the compute time ratio. Uh, again, if you go to 0 0.001 uh, like uh, R values, we'll get even bigger uh, savings for three dimensional uh, models. And so far I have discussed only about the simple nonlinear wave and the results mainly were shown for simple linear waves, but we have done all those analysis also for two representative nonlinear waves. One is the mildly nonlinear non viscous shallow water waves. The viscous shallow water waves is this. This is the PDE derived by using a, what is known as center manifold theory without depth averaging. This is a shallow water wave. Shallow water wave equations are typically derived using depth averaging from the Navier-Stokes, uh, full 3D Navier-Stokes equations. But this equation is derived without depth averaging, which means this is more accurate. Using uh, what is known as center manifold theory, this uh, this was the work by my PhD supervisor, A.J. Roberts and uh, uh, Lee. But this captures uh, uh, most uh, elements of viscous shallow water uh, waves, except the depth, except resolving the depth. And this has uh, physical instability in it. So if we were to simulate this using path scheme, the path scheme eigenvalues must be, the real part of the path scheme eigenvalues must be positive when it has to be positive and negative when it has to be negative. If you plot the eigenvalue spectrum, for the path scheme and the full domain scheme, this is how we get. And we do get these physically unstable modes. And the path scheme, which are the blue circles, do exactly resolve the physically unstable modes as well as the physically stable modes. And that's a good success uh, for the nonlinear viscous uh, shallow water waves, but that's only mildly nonlinear because it's uh, just a viscous flow. And in a similar way, uh, Roberts also has derived a turbulent shallow water wave, again using center manifold theory without using any depth averaging, but using the depth average quantities uh, uh, just to represent the dynamics. He used uh, Smagarinsky turbulent, uh, turbulence model to derive this. So it essentially captured the uh, Smagarinsky turbulence models uh, characteristics, but it's a simple PD. And if we were to use the path scheme to simulate such a highly strongly nonlinear turbulent shallow water waves, path scheme still succeeds. And here is the spectral path scheme uh, uh, eigenvalue spectrum. These are much more unstable than the viscous shallow water waves, and more modes are unstable. The path scheme captures both the unstable modes and the more stable modes uh, almost exactly. So uh, we have done uh, whatever uh, analysis we have done for the linear waves. We have also done for the nonlinear waves, and we did uh, spectral analysis like this, and linear and nonlinear stability analysis, analytic matrix perturbation analysis, sensitivity analysis for numerical round of errors. That's uh, that itself is a big study to show that the path scheme is not too much sensitive to the numerical round of errors and computational complexity analysis to quantify the computational savings and for a very wide range of physical and grid parameters. And uh, yeah, that's be too much detailed. Uh, so I will not talk about that. This is uh, 
turbulent uh, shallow water wave simulation. The, particularly, this is called a roll wave simulation. We can see that typically in a, in a long, na narrow channels. This is a highly nonlinear uh, phenomena. And the patch scheme uh, captures uh, very accurately. As I said, these small uh, fine grids are full domain simulation, and uh, these color ribbons are pass scheme simulations. And the bigger circles are full domain simulations. I oh, know bigger circles are pass scheme simulations. Smaller circles are the uh, full domain micro scale simulation. I plotted these circles to compare uh, uh, to show the discrepancy, and the discrepancy is small. I think uh, the pass schemes are uh, really accurate. Mm, yep, uh, that's about the second patch schemes. Now I'm getting to the multiscale CFD. So most real world uh, unsteady fluid flows are there is additional R here, are hyperbolic type, uh, which means uh, there is wave uh, contained in it, and then there is uh, high advection. So the multiscale staggered patch schemes open up a whole new research area under the computational fluid multiscale equation free multi scale computational fluid dynamics. And the CFD has seen uh, significant acceleration after uh, the invention of the staggered grid long back uh, after Harlow's uh, uh, staggered grids. And uh, there might be potential, uh, potentially a similar uh, impact uh, or possibly disruptive transformation because of the staggered uh, multi scale uh, patch grids and the patch schemes. Uh, that's uh, yet to explore in the future, and and even for non-multi-scale systems, if you take a laminar flow, there is not really much of multi-scale as in the turbulence. The staggered uh, uh, patch schemes uh, can give much more compared to the usual mesh grading, the adaptive meshing, and other contemporary methods. Even in the mesh grading, if you were to keep a finer and finer grid near solid uh, solid walls, we would end up with aspect ratio uh, issues. But in the patch grid, we will not have that because the patches uh, are always squares, and inside the squares, we can have any, however small the micro uh, sub patch micro grid has to be, we can go as long as it is not hit by the numerical round of errors. And there are many such uh, advantages, and we don't even, uh, this is my vision. Uh, of course, this is a research question. So we, we possibly don't need any limiters, relaxation or multigrid acceleration or anything of that sort uh, for the. If we were to do the computational fluid dynamic simulation using the staggered patch schemes and that is it to explore. Uh, yep, uh, coming to the positive impacts of multi scale CFD. In the recent times, the CFD has uh, grown into like uh, 3 billion, uh, around 3 billion. Uh, market. So if uh, we could realize 10 to the 5 simulation, 10 to the 5, uh, I don't think uh, the same 10 to the 5 could be brought exactly with for the realistic CFD simulations. Even if it becomes like 100 to 1000 uh, times faster, it's going to make a huge impact both economically and environmentally because of the power consumptions uh, and emission because of the compute resources. And coming to the turbulence simulation, and, uh, we all must have heard of uh, very famous quotes about uh, turbulence that oh, I want to see turbulence being solved before I die and things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, because the staggered multi scale pass schemes uh, do excellent job of uh, very accurately capturing the micro scale dynamics at the same time uh, doing it all very efficiently, it has a great potential to, to contribute to uh, in a breakthrough pro progress in uh, in the unresolved problem of solving turbulence, uh, particularly because of these two reasons. One, patch schemes accurately capture the nonlinear physics at the finest scales, unlike the RANs and LES, which uh, do uh, typically the subgrid modeling uh, through empirical relations. But here, patch scheme capture that accurately. And of course, the 10 to the 5 are smaller, 1000 or whatever, for realistic. Uh, problems. Uh, yeah, it will, both of these points would uh, significantly empower the patch schemes uh, to make a significant progress in uh, turbulence simulations. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, everybody.
Thank you very much, Diwar. I think it was great uh, listening to your work and the achievement that you have shown. Uh, we are Thank you. open for questions, uh, if there is any. Yeah, uh, Divaha, this is Trinath. Uh, yep. So you have uh, validated with uh, only the shallow water equation. So have you done like uh, regular cases like driven cavity or heated shallow cavity where uh, uh, you know there are like standard results available? That would be the next step. Uh, yeah, so currently no, all only shallow water wave equations. Primarily okay. because of reducing the complexities and for the shallow water equations, we can do much of a uh, analytical uh, characterization. If you were to do the full uh, Navier-Stokes equations, uh, we need to handle with this pressure Poisson uh, thing right? yes. that is going to make the uh, path scheme nasty. So, but now that we have got the staggered path schemes uh, uh, and it is proven, uh, now we can take the next step a bit boldly. Yeah, that will be the next step. Okay. And one more uh, related question: the uh, the number of permiss the, uh, the permissible grids. Uh, permissible patches or configuration mm -hmm. of patches that is dependent on the system of equations that are of interest. So very, for every very so for very uh, new system of equations or a different configuration of system of equations, this analysis has to be uh, repeated, the spectral analysis. Uh, true, uh, short answer oh. is true. Okay. Uh, and how this, much overhead is that in terms of time? How long would it take to do this spectral analysis? Is it automated or? Uh, uh, which analysis uh, you are talking about the studying the grids? Yes, which patches, which configuration of patches to use? Oh, that, that that's only for the development, actually. Once we finish the developing and say like, OK, this patch grid is good enough. Uh, in fact, uh, almost all of the results that I showed used this patch grid. So we have, this is only the initial uh, initial characterization of the patch grid. And this particular patch grid is straight away is good for uh, CFD simulations. I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. See, this is good enough for safety simulations because of the derivatives present in the in the Navier-Stokes equations. In fact, okay. the, we have designed more complex uh, staggered uh, multi-scale grids to resolve the higher to to discretize the higher uh, spatial uh, uh, derivatives. If in the nonlinear wave equations, if you see, we will have like a cubic uh, and other higher de order derivatives. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, here. So uh, now it is done. It, it was only the original progress. So now the staggered path scheme is good for waves, uh, ideal waves, linear waves, and uh, <coughs> some some typical nonlinear waves, which should cover up most problems. For Navier-Stokes equations, it's already covered. The simple, uh, simple. Uh, Patch grid that we used for uh, for simple nonlinear wave that's good enough uh, for uh, uh, for okay. Navier-Stokes equations. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You look wanted to ask. Look. Sorry, Dil Dilshad, are you talking to me? No. Uh, no, there was a question. Yeah, Sri thanks. Yeah, if you wanted to predict the tsunami kind of situations uh, mm -hmm. the uh, i think there are many people have attempted after uh, the last tsunami so yeah. uh, is that uh, direction is more uh, robust now with respect to the computational effort that's required keeping sorry, view of uh, no the computational see the predicting the tsunami is uh, still as a challenging numerically yeah so with these methods will provide a better insight. Definitely, most definitely, that is one of the one of the very important use case of the staggered path schemes or the path schemes itself. So particularly because it's a wave, staggered path scheme uh, is going to be very impactful uh, for the tsunami simulation. That's one of the very important use case for this. That's correct. Yeah. So in fact, one of my what about the weather prediction uh, domain? Same, same. For any wave systems, it's going to uh, uh, be highly impactful. In fact, one of my conference presentation itself was titled like uh, 
accurate multi uh, multi scale modeling enables tsunami prediction something like that okay yeah so do so do you plan to uh, create a solver out of this scheme so that people can use it for tsunami predictions yeah, I would love to. Yeah, uh, I'm progressing on that direction, but uh, yeah, I don't have any way, any any quick uh, desires. Like uh, it will take a substantial time. As people have rightly asked, it, we are still working with the periodic boundary conditions, and the grids are very limited. So it's a very very young and active area of research. It will take uh, so quite some time to come to a, a practical application to a real world geometry. But yes, I will keep developing and uh, as a open source software and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, what is the resources that's required you are talking about it? Computational resources. Uh, it depends on the problem and the resolution, I would say. Uh, so uh, whatever uh, computation that we have done is just for model equations, right? So these are not realistic, uh, full uh, resolved uh, Navier-Stokes equations or anything with the real geometry or anything. We just took a rectangular, simple and nice uh, domain and and, uh, and used a simple uh, linear and nonlinear waves. Uh, so we have basically designed how many nodes to use and how many uh, how how much multi-scale uh, characters uh, we want to capture all that because of the interest in just development. When we apply to the realistic geometry and the realistic problem, that's when we'll come to know the uh, the real uh, required computational facilities. But we can tell about the, the ratio uh, of the computational savings. That is what I have shown as 10 to the power of five for one case. Yeah, for the shallow case, uh, what is the computational power you have used? Oh, that's just a, a normal uh, our station with uh, what to say, Intel quad core. Uh, and yeah, I needed a lot of RAM, 64 GB RAM I used. That's only because I had to explore these many grids and, and do many parallel runs and stuff like that. So uh, this, uh, I don't know how well uh, this will help for the realistic situation so as a user. So this is just the development case. Uh, yeah, it has basically a bit of time uh, to come. So we can say one thing that it, it can give uh, at least 1,000 times uh, or 10,000 times so, uh, computational savings uh, for sure. Uh, even though I have been uh, I have been on the conservative side uh, about uh, hundreds and thousands for realistic geometry, uh, as we increase the complexity within the patches, the computational savings will go up. Uh, so, uh, I think we are going to get very good say computational savings. OK, so you have shown the round of errors are minimum numerical round of errors. Yeah, the patch schemes are not sensitive to the numerical round of errors. We can go patch scale ratio as small as R 0 0.0001. That's what I have shown. Yeah, go ahead. OK, okay. thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everybody. Uh, is there any question, or else we'll conclude the session? Okay. So uh, you you need a favor, uh, Diva. Yep. If the people have been asking question in between and at the end also. So you have to tell which question you like the most. Which was the most oh. interesting question? I liked uh, actually many questions. I like the question about the periodic boundary limitations of a periodic boundary condition. Someone asked, I don't remember. And then I like the uh, comparison of this patch scheme with the representative volume element uh, method and comparing uh, with the typical homogenization approach. That was a beautiful question. And I liked the. Uh, I liked the. Uh, the how how useful this is uh, for the weather prediction and tsunamis, and in fact, I, I liked all the questions. Okay. The I, I, question I knew was, I will. Okay. I knew I will get the questions of this kind uh, as after you said like uh, most of them are uh, PGs and PhDs, and I liked it. Yeah, I would say the most I liked would be the representative volume element and homogenization thing. Okay. 
that that's close very relevant thank you thank you so i think uh, there is no more question uh, uh, let us conclude so uh, on behalf of uh, uh, this our group is called ic group uh, so they were on behalf of ic group and then process engineering group uh, from prdd uh, we thank uh, you for your nice presentation and great work that you have shared with us. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you all for your kind attention and nice questions to Diva. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much to all of you for uh, for uh, fantastic interactive uh, participation. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much.